Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Now, as the province braces for a potential severe drought condition, collaborative efforts are underway to mitigate the impact on communities, the economy, and the environment. Now, in a move that the province is calling a landmark agreement, 38 prominent water licensees across southern Alberta have voluntarily come together to address the looming water crisis, representing a significant portion of water allocation in the key basin areas, including the Red Deer River, the Bow River, and the Old Man River. These stakeholders have committed to reducing their water usage if drought conditions intensify in the coming months. This new water sharing agreement marks a pivotal moment in Alberta's municipal affairs, aiming to ensure equitable access to water resources during times of scarcity. Through the concentrated efforts of municipalities, industries, and irrigation districts, tangible steps are being taken to curb water consumption without compromising essential needs or critical operations. Now, participating municipalities in these agreements are poised to implement measures aimed at reducing water consumption by 5 to 10 percent, leveraging practical strategies that prioritize efficiencies without impeding essential services or indoor water use. Now, to gain deeper insights into the significance of these agreements and the roadmap ahead for municipalities, we have the privilege of speaking with Tanya Thorne, mayor of the town of Okotoks, who brings a valuable perspective as a member of the province's Water Advisory Committee. Through our conversation, we will speak about these new water sharing agreements, the strategies municipalities can adopt to fulfill their commitments to reducing water use, and the collective resolve of navigating the challenges of water scarcity in Alberta. This is Municipal Affairs. Mayor Thorne, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting your initial reactions from today's announcement from the province of a new water sharing agreement between uh, stakeholders and uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, 38, uh, just want to make sure, yeah, 38 prominent water licensees. Uh, is this a good step for the potential impending drought conditions that we're going to expect to see this summer? Uh, absolutely it is. I think the province has done a great job of being um, proactive on this file and creating that collaborative um, work environment. So um, this, I think, is the outcome of being prepared about it and allowing there to be a conversation. So I think it's a great step. Now, this conversation just didn't happen overnight. Uh, according to the con the press conference this morning, this has been an ongoing effort. You were appointed to the province's Water Advisory Committee earlier in February. Take us through the process of where we are and how we got here, if you don't mind, from your perspective as uh, a mayor on this committee. Um, yeah, so I wasn't actually involved in the water sharing, striking any of the water sharing agreements. I'm I'm on a, the water advisory committee, which is more um, advisory, advising Alberta Environment and Alberta Ag on what we're seeing on the ground on drought and the bigger picture of which is the part I guess I'm probably excited around water management in the future and, and what that will look like. Um, but I think, you know, Minister uh, Schultz has done a great job. She put out letters to municipalities back in November um, saying droughts coming. Um, well, droughts here. Forget about droughts coming. Droughts here. Um, and, you know, we're going to all need to work together to do that. And they did the same thing on the egg side and to industry. So, um, you know, last summer in southern Alberta, we dealt with drought, um, you know, a little deeper than we were, I guess, than where I'm situated in Okotoks. But, you know, the old man watershed, they had some significant challenges last summer already. So this is a second year of a drought situation. And if I was maybe borderlining on a third um, year, you know, so drought in southern Alberta is not uncharacteristic. I think what we're seeing this year in um, Alberta, we've got 51 streams with water advisories on them um, and low flow advisories. That's that's unprecedented in my time, at least, um, of paying attention to what's going on in our rivers and our streams. So this agreement is 
how are we all going to manage together? Because this isn't one industry or one area's responsibility to solve. It's all of us as Albertans. It's every Albertan's responsibility to help us manage our way around this. So what are municipalities doing right here, right now? You talk about the letters that Minister Schultz sent out at the beginning of the year, even if I'm not mistaken, early last year in 2023. What are what are the steps municipalities are taking right now? Is there any concrete steps that even your community of Okotoks has taken to reduce the consumption of water? Because this is a big deal if we are going into the uh, drought conditions that we are expected to. And if you speak to municipalities across, or even farmers, I should say, across Alberta, there is some major concern. So is there steps that municipalities are taking right now, even Okotoks, to reduce their water consumption? You bet. So I think um, most municipalities have had a look at their um, water shortage response plans. If they didn't have one, they're in the process of creating those. So water shortage response plan is basically what is the steps you're going to do as a community to manage water if you should get this. And it's it's not just about drought, right? It could be you have a water main break. It could be, um, you know, a leak somewhere. There, there's lots of scenarios. Your reservoirs drop for whatever reason. Um, you know, the situations you saw in Cochrane earlier this year, all of those things play into a water shortage response plan. Um, but there certainly is a lens on drought. Um, I know I've seen a lot of water bylaws in the last, um, I'm going to say in the last four weeks um, of municipalities making changes or at least reviewing things. That's one of the things we did here in Okotoks. So Okotoks is always, so one of the biggest culprits, in my opinion, on municipal water demand, especially over the summer season, is outdoor watering. We have a real desire to put drinking water to have green lawns, which I don't understand because who wants to mow grass? If you water it, you have to mow it. Anyways, that's a whole different conversation, Chris, probably for a different show. Um, but for me, um, it's about that outdoor watering piece. So Okotoks put, uh, we've had an outdoor watering schedule in our community for over 20 years where um, our, our residents have been able to water two days a week. Um, for three hours on each of those days. So for a total of six hours a week. We made a change to our water bylaw. We worked with some the best, um, current best practices for turf management. And we've reduced that to four hours a week. So they get two days a week still for two hours a day. Um, we're seeing other communities follow suit in some form and fashion of that. Um, uh, <laughs> and so that's kind of what's out there right now. Do you get a sense that there's buy-in from the residents? Because as the mayor, as municipalities, you have to uh, implement these bylaws. But unless there's buy-in from residents, a bylaw is just a piece of paper at the end of the day. When you're talking to residents, even in your own community, do you get a sense that they understand the severity of what's going on in Alberta right now around the drought conditions that are here and coming? Um, you know what, I think overall, there's a general understanding, but um, this is probably the piece where we need to have a bigger conversation, which is the part that I think um, Minister Schultz is leaning to is around water management as a, a, a in the future. What does that look like, especially as we continue to grow like we are as a province? We can't continue to do that, drive up our industry and consume water in the way that we currently do today. It, it, they, they all don't mesh. Um, and so we need to have a different conversation, I think, with Albertans as a whole around how do we use water. So as an example, in my community, I did a water update last week, the week before, I think it was, um, where I talked all things water in our community. And my community is unique in that we've been talking about water in my community for 20 years. So it's not new to them. So we probably in a lot of ways sit a bit on the leading edge of a lot of municipalities because my, my residents are accustomed to the conversation. They're accustomed to a water schedule. They're accustomed that their grass can manage with two days a week. They know all of these things. So, but what we started talking about is I started talking to my community around what would a 10% reduction look like in your household? And, and it starts with 
understanding how much water you consume to start with. Because majority of Albertans don't actually know how much water do you consume in your house in a month? What is it that you use? So we've started putting out some generic messaging about that of, okay, how do you understand your water bill? What does that look like in your household per person? How much water per person are you using in a month? And then here's ways that you could reduce water, you know, so that whole education piece around water, right? People don't think about it when they stand brushing their teeth and leave the tap running, you know, and anytime you leave the tap running, it's six liters of water typically, you know, is the average six liters of water per minute going down the top, down the drain. So, you know, if you're constantly doing that and you brush your teeth twice a day um, for at least a minute, you know, that's 12 liters of water a day, you know, and you multiply that through all of those little changes make substantial bit differences to water usage. So on the flip side of that, though, because we're talking about the residential standpoint here, but what concrete actions do municipalities have to do to reduce their water consumption as well because you have pools you uh, you water mm -hmm. your lawns as well you water flowers on main street is there concrete actions that the municipalities because whenever i speak to municipal leaders it's always lead by example right you don't want yeah. to tell people to do something if you're not willing to do it as yourself so is there concrete actions that okotoks is doing right now to reduce their water <laughs> consumption because at the end of the day, the municipality still uses water as well. You bet. Absolutely. You bet. So um, we are, we've done a lot of work and you'll see lots of municipalities looking at this to identify what are we losing to leakage? So what, what happens just in general water infrastructure, where, what are you losing to leakage? So we've gotten up to a fairly tight system in Okotoks, um, still room for improvement as always, but um, so that's that's number one. That's the biggest culprit. Um, we've taken for our trees and our flowers that we plant, we use non-potable water. So that's water that hasn't gone through our drinking water system um, and and isn't treated drinking water. So it come, it's different than our license. Um, we've also got a variety of our sports fields that we have been able to work with the province to use non-potable water on an irrigation system for those. We have a pilot project um, currently in Okotoks going where we're going to look at some storm water reuse to irrigate a ball field. So for us as a municipality, one of the things that we try and manage, particularly for our high use fields um, and competitive fields, is we've got to keep those fields maintain to it a, a standard that doesn't result in injury to the players that are using it, right? So it's this, this a bit of a balance. So we, when we did our water shortage response plan, we laid out very specifically, these are the things the municipality is doing and how each of these stages will impact us and where we will make cuts. Um, so at stage four, we have a five stage plan at stage four, there's a 50%, well, our non-priority fields go to zero watering and our priority fields will get a 50% reduction um, in watering so that we can still keep that physical health and activity happening um, through the summer. So those are some of the things that we are doing as a municipality. Um, I think the other one is obviously we're pushing on changes long-term to gray water reuse, water reuse in general, stormwater reuse, um, and how do all of those mechanisms play into the system of water management? So I want to flip a little bit here for a second, if you don't mind, and talk about the advisory committee that you're part on. I know this has nothing to do with the sharing agreement, but you it's about three months now since you were appointed to that board, how have those meetings gone? Because I would not be doing my job because I know the moment this gets out, I will get at least one person emailing me saying, well, it snowed last week. So how can you say that we have a water shortage when it's snowing all the time? From your standpoint, do you see what's going on and saying, okay, it's a little bit good, but it's still not as good as we want it to be? 
Yeah, you know, so we certainly are getting updates. And I think that's one of the things that the province is waiting for is the snowpack update, which will come here at the end of the month. Um, you know, so we're seeing the updates on river flows and snowpacks, and, and they're really doing a lot of work to get some of that real time data. Um, we'll see more of that ramp up here um, when May comes, just because a lot of this on stream monitoring kicks off in May. They don't do it all winter long. Um, and so those decisions, those mechanisms are there so that decisions can be managed in real time without necessarily needing to be on the river. Um, I think what I appreciate from my perspective of the committee is the diversity of thought and everybody's driving to um, the same outcome. And that's ultimately that we have water in our province for generations to consume, industry to consume, agriculture to thrive, um, and and the environment to be well maintained so that our you know, fishermen can still go and fish as they need to, right? And so there's lots of those balances. And it's what I really appreciate is that it's changed. It's brought to the drought this year is brought, or this conversation on drought has brought water to the forefront, that it's being talked about in places that it typically we take it for granted. So it's being talked about in a way that it hasn't been. And so really looking at that wholesome approach of where does storage fit? What are natural solutions? All of those pieces. And I think that's the exciting part from my perspective of this committee as we move forward. What are you looking for over the next few months? Because we are we're not in the worst of it yet. And I say that with respect to where we are right now, because I've just driven almost across all, all of Alberta over the last few months, and I'm seeing the dry conditions that we're uh, under. Is there anything as the mayor you're looking at to ensure that maybe this could be a better off year than most people expect? Or is there something you're looking at and say, okay, if this happens, then we're going to potentially be in a worse condition than we were last year or the year before? Yeah, um, I think there's a few things from my perspective. Um, we need some timely May and June rains. Um, so that is certainly, you know, if anybody's got a really good rain dance, this would be the time to really pull that out. Um, you know, so we need some timely um, rain for sure. Um, you know, this last few snowfalls has taken an edge off, I will say, um, that, you know, it, it's given us a little room, I guess, to breathe. But we're still in a drought where reservoirs in southern Alberta are low, you know, crops are dry, like fields are dry. It's it's dry. We're not at a normal state. And our snowpack is still not at average, you know, and we came into last year with an average snowpack. So we're we're down that way. So that's one of the things I think that needs to happen. The other one, and we, you know, I, I don't know if people are correlating it, but fire. I think fire is going to be another piece, wildfire. So I'm really, you know, we're looking at in my own municipality of what is our fire smart fire prevention messaging going to be, because that is the other side of this. If, if we get hit with a knock on wood season, like last year, um, that's going to have an impact on what's available from a water perspective for everything else. So we all need to do our part again as Albertans to be, we should be doing it anyways, but this year we need to be hyper vigilant about fire. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's another trigger you'll see with municipalities is that there will be a lot of fire bans potentially very early in the year. Um, but, you know, everybody needs to be responsible. You know, if you're a smoker, don't throw the butt out the window. Like anything that's triggering that, you know, if you're on your, quads and your motorbikes think about that hot um, engine and where you are and what that could look like you know and take all of those necessary precautions to keep all of us safe and to make sure that we are wa have water there for health safety and industry you're also part of the board of directors for Alberta municipalities and I'm assuming you're having conversations like we are right now with other mayors across or even uh, uh, councillors from across uh, Alberta. Do you get a sense that there's an all in this together approach that municipalities are wanting to do this right so that way we don't have a catastrophe on our hands potentially in a few months or even next year at this time? 
Um, I think it varies across. So, yes, I think all municipalities are interested, but I think it varies across the province, right? And um, Northern Alberta, and there's some issues in Northern Alberta right now. We've got, you know, some droughts conditions in Northern Alberta, but Northern Alberta's typically had a surplus of water. For, you know, there's an abundance of water in Northern Alberta. Um, so they, they haven't had the same conversations about water as residents and municipalities in Southern Alberta. You know, this isn't the first rodeo with low flow and drought in, in Southern Alberta. Um, but I, so what I think is that there's just, there's some different dialogue happening in different spots in the province, um, which is okay because we're at all at different stages in an understanding of how water works. Um, and, but I do believe that as a whole, municipalities want to do the right thing. Um, they want to contribute where they contribute. And I believe that about Albertans, right? The majority of Albertans want to help where they can help. They just need municipalities in the province to tell them how to help. Um, because we haven't had this conversation about water management and what that looks like, right? It's not about telling people that you can't have a bath or that you can't have a shower, but maybe you don't need to have a 45 minute shower. Maybe you could try having a 15 minute shower, right? And, and every, what every does mother that and father who has a teenage son or daughter is now <laughs> looking at you going, what do you mean? How am I supposed to tell my child not to have a 15 minute shower or 45 minute <laughs> well, shower? I'll tell you, so I'll tell you how I did it in my household when my daughter was that age is that we had an egg timer and the whole piece. And so um, I'd go down and turn the hot water tank off or I'd turn the hot water off. And so <laughs> there was cold pretty darn quick. You know, so there again, it's about having a conversation as families. And that's what I've encouraged my community to do. Sit down as a family and talk about water use. You know, how much does it cost you a minute per shower? You know, what... How does how do those residents make that 10% reduction, which really in the scheme of things for most residents is a very small is really small incremental changes. If everybody reduced their shower by one minute, you know, it, it's a non issue in most households. So my last question before I let you go here, Mayor, is um, what advice would you give to residents today? Because we might have someone who's tuning into this and saying, oh, what should I do? What can I do? We talked about one let, let a minute less showers or even turning off the taps while brushing your teeth. Is there any concrete measure that you would say, if you want to make sure that this is not a issue a year from now, this is a good first step? Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a few things that, um, first of all, any resident that's got um, water meters, um, and so they get a water metered bill, go find your bill and find out how much water you're using per month. Figure out how much of that water is being used per person. Have a conversation with your family around, okay, what does that look like? Um, test every toilet in your house for leaks. So get the food coloring out, put it in the bowl, you know, in the, in the tank and see if it ends up in the bowl. If it does, you got to leak, fix it. Cause those are slow killer, slow water users, right? Um, if you've got a water humidifier, same thing, check that, make sure it's not leaking. So confer confirm that you've got a tight household from a leak perspective, you know, and that can be as simple as nobody uses any water for, an hour and you check your water meter at the start and the end. If the water meter changed, you've got a leak somewhere and then do some investigating. So those are, those are some of the first pieces. Then from there, I would recommend, you know, take and think about, do you run the water, don't run that tap, right? Um, do you tend to bath instead of shower? Could you substitute one shower for a bath? Cause bath is a high consumption of water. Are you washing your laundry? and running your dishwasher with a full load. Um, those are other elements. You know, what happens if you, if everybody in the household reduced a shower by one minute? You know, um, I was pretty cheeky in my community of, you know, maybe there's some in your family that you could shower together and, you know, save yourself a whole shower. So, but I think it's about being thoughtful about it. You know, like for me, a couple of things I do in my own household is, if I need to run the tap to get warm water, I have a glass, one, because I drink a lot of water. So I have a glass always by the sink to fill that up. And then I also have my indoor plants 
um, bucket. Um, I have a I have a colleague that is a huge plant outdoor plant um, person. That's inner peace for him. And last year he kept a five gallon bulk bucket in his shower. So when he turned that on and was waiting for hot water, you, you know, he'd fill that and then he used it to water plants outside. So how can you repurpose water in some respects so that it's available? If you've got to run it, it's not going down the drain. You can use it for something else that you maybe don't turn the tap on for. So those are some easy ones. Get some rain barrels for outside. That's what I was about to say, because I know in our household, we we have two rain barrels and my husband swears by them. So get a rain barrel. Yeah. Highly recommend them. Um, Mayor Thorne, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Sorry for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's always a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. Yeah, anytime, Chris. Happy to be joined. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, the local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.